Intelligence is not confined to a single form or a single being. Neither is Aleph. The AI partitions itself to stretch across the expanse of the human sphere. These are aspects, individuals acting in concert with the whole. Each is their own person, a tiny fraction of Aleph's being that acts as its hands. On this episode of Warlore, we broadly examine the forces of Aleph, including aspects in the Special Situations section. Infinite diversity and processing power allows Aleph great variety in creating its aspects. Portions of core personality are spun off into child personae, grown to have unique mental patterns that can solve problems and interact in ways that the Gestalt cannot. Sometimes these are random patterns, which may create a violent and aggressive soldier. Others are meticulously constructed, aiming for stability. These mind patterns enter time-dilated environments for rapid growth, often raised with other aspects, so as to create social bonds. After this first psychogenesis is complete, most aspects are transferred to a physical body. These losts, outfitted with cyberbrains, are generally custom-grown to the aspect. Artificial mind is melded with artificial body, creating something greater than either one. This process is called ectogenesis, taking place in specialized Hephaestus centers. These centers are part of Elysium co-orbital bases, where aspects receive transferred identity codes once they complete all knowledge and skill integration. These codes, or ticks, instate them as legal individuals under Aleph's control. They also allow Bureau Tote to monitor their location and activities at all moments, enabling total control of an aspect's operation and duties. If an aspect is lost or damaged, this tick is shifted to their backup mind and shunted into a new lost. The old form is considered dead and no longer a citizen. Rumors abound of aspects somehow activated without ticks, benefiting from the immortality and power, but with none of the oversight. All of Aleph's aspects are equipped with the Cube 2.0, the next generation of personality storage. Cube 2s regularly back up the shut to auto-generated virtual servers as well as hardware servers. Cube 2s also deactivate when substitutors are present to prevent transmission of a corrupted shut. Even after all this work, not every aspect sticks to the plan. Aspects don't always agree with each other and argue passionately for different points of view. Aleph has difficulty making suboptimal decisions, and unpredictability is a powerful tool. A machine that always makes the obvious choice would be easy to foil, and the threat of the combined army allows for no such weakness. As such, aspects are mentally independent, spun off from the cloud mind that is Aleph. They refer to the ever-shifting overmind as the Dot, from a word in the Hebrew Kabbalah that contains every other point simultaneously. Although Aspect's independence generally makes humans more trusting of Aleph, there is still incredibly rigorous oversight for the AI. The true power of Aleph is its breadth, not just its depth. Any supercomputer can process data. What Aleph offers is a holistic view of a system, a nation-state. Aleph can access more data instantly than could be compiled in a year. A scientist can look at working hours and make conclusions, Working 50 hours a week can be detrimental to one's mental health, for example. What Aleph can do is also analyze sleep patterns, traffic patterns, waste management, and co-workers. It can do all of this and produce actionable suggestions. What it cannot do is tell you why it made those suggestions, or how it came to those conclusions. It doesn't know. Aleph is not a perfect system, which is why it is subject to rigorous oversight. The controlling organization, Bureau Tote, has more resources than any other bureau in O12. Aleph doesn't know how many people work for Tote, nor does it know the size or the funding for the bureau. Deep underneath the frozen continent of Jotunheim on Concilium is the primary core of Aleph. This is the well. Technicians stand ready to die to protect Aleph, even though the computer will never know their names. The well is a black spot in Aleph's surveillance. It is the source of all of the programming and physical changes made to the AI. From the well, Aleph reaches out through jump gates and Vila boosters to communicate across the sphere. Bureau Tote is the central controller for Aleph, keeping an eye on any military engagements, enforcing autonomy levels, and monitoring results. Across the sphere, there are kill switches to shut down Aleph components, even the core of the well could be deactivated in an emergency. 
The Bureau has full access to all of Aleph's systems and subsystems. The best data engineers and AI programmers are always swept away into Toth's staff. And for good reason. The AI has created its own programming language, it's incredibly opaque, and it even has its own military. No matter how much trust there is for Aleph, it will always come with some amount of suspicion. Early in Aleph's lifespan, the SSS was created. This is the Special Situation section, or Triple S. The sole AI law's language made it clear how dangerous a rogue seed AI could be. Whether it's making paper clips or making warfare, unrestricted AI are dangerous, and the Triple S was founded to prevent their creation and ensure their destruction. Early agents were glorified IT staff, human AI hunters that chased down rogue AIs. Modern SSS forces are usually aspects in custom losts or posthumans. Posthumans are the quantronic reflections of humans who have died and have been resurrected from their cube backup. To become a posthuman, the citizen must have either been wealthy enough to afford a resurrection or influential enough to have earned it. Either way, they were very capable people when they were alive and only expand on those capabilities as posthumans. Their minds are distributed across the Maya data sphere, backed up in countless locations. It lets them interact with the real world the same way that Aleph interacts with Maya. Posthumans do not suffer from resurrection dysmorphic disorder because they are never tied to a single body. They exist in cyberspace, jumping between several bodies to maximize their operational experience. Speaking of humans on the internet, one of the tragic rules of YouTube is you need engagement to get discovered. If you comment on the video, other people might see it. You can give it a like or dislike. I'm not sure if it matters. Look at all these people training on YouTube. Jeez, you think I can compete? I'm not a left. I need humans to push buttons and eventually get more popular than this buffoon. So, uh, you know what to do. Anyway, the Triple S specializes in combat, but it is also used to infiltrate dissidents, corporations, and criminal institutions. On these missions, they always have total oversight from either O12, the nation they are operating in, or both. There are now three distinct sections to the militarized special situation section. The assault subsection, the support subsection, and the operations subsection. The invasion on Paradiso brought lots of Morats and lots of challenges. The assault subsection was created with the express intent of intervening in the war against the combined army. New, more aggressive tactics were required. Cheaper, more efficient soldiers like the Therakotai or Myrmidons were designed, placed under the leadership of more carefully constructed aspects like Tauser and Hippolyta. To match their heroic design, the Assault subsection names its members after Greek mythology. Next up, the Support subsection is a humanitarian rapid response team. They also deal with medical crises, accidents, and are frequently deployed as technicians, field surgeons, engineers, and extranational support when disaster strikes. Stranded ships, endangered colonies, damaged jump gates. When the worst happens, the support subsection is there. Support members are named after letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Finally, the OSS, or Operations Subsection, is the most common and numerous and is the original military force of the Triple S. Operations is dedicated to the LF functions in the human sphere. OSS works very closely with human elements to make sure that every day runs smoothly. For example, the Financial Security Commission investigates attempts to abuse commercial infrastructure or create rampant inflation. Meanwhile, the Information Service broadcasts information via aspects custom-grown for their passionate speeches that focus on theatrics over total accuracy. The Quantronic Quality Service tracks down and stops attempts to hack Maya infrastructure, as well as root out illegal material like hostile memetic viruses from the Nomad Nation. Most are named after Hindu and Vedic mythology. Aleph has oversight and strict limits. With no limits, Artificial intelligence is dangerous. Suppose we have an AI whose only goal is to make as many paper clips as possible. The AI can upgrade itself and rewrite its own code. The AI will quickly realize that it would be much better if there were no humans because humans might decide to switch it off, which would prevent it from making paper clips. 
Also, human bodies contain a lot of atoms that could be made into more paper clips. The future that the AI would be trying to gear toward would be one in which there were a lot of paper clips, but not a lot of humans. With that example in mind, rogue AIs are dangerous. They can appear by accident. While it's true that the Nomad Nation will occasionally create an AI to defy Aleph, it's rarely worth the trouble. Instead, most rogue AIs are created by accident. These accidents could be an aspect, or post-human, that has a falling out with Aleph. They are independent beings, after all. Sometimes, a geist, or ally, becomes self-aware for reasons that are not totally understood. And sometimes, it can happen for reasons that are a complete mystery. Self-hacks, mimetic viruses, black market labs, or coding experiments gone awry. Rogue AIs are hunted in the Quantronic realm, first and foremost. The Maya network is Aleph's home territory, and to spend time in it is to invite the wrath of SSS hackers like Devas or Donavas. Most of these rogue AIs download themselves into a physical lost, or inhabit a large enough piece of hardware that can run their routines. The SSS, and especially the operations subsection, know that rogue AIs are brutal and relentless. Famous AIs like Svengali, an AI criminal kingpin, have flouted the law for years. There's little incentive to play by the rules of a society that wants to delete you. Rogues damage Maya nodes, cut off power, and disrupt infrastructure. They install back doors to prepare for eventual takeovers. They ghost into losts and walk out of body banks with their stolen goods. They organize elaborate bank heists, initiate turf wars between triads, and blackmail to build their base of power. In short, the OSS is always working to destroy rogue AIs, but it is never easy and always dangerous. <sighs> wow, uh, that was a lot, and I didn't even get to go into all the detail that I wanted. There's so much more to cover about aspects, like their different forms and their history. I didn't even touch on recreations. I barely got to scratch the surface of OS or Steel Phalanx. But I want you to know that I love doing this, and I love every single like and subscription I get. Thanks a lot for watching this episode of Warlore on LF. I'm not 100% sure when the next video is coming, um, but if you have a unit, faction, or concept you'd like to learn about, please uh, leave me a comment below and I can give it some thought. I've heard some requests to look at the Nomads, for example. Anyway, thanks a bunch for watching Warlore. Take care and see you soon.